Welcome everyone to this seminar. Uh, it's called Why We Need Multicultural Worship. So there are three speakers of us, all connected through the Multicultural Worship Ministry of the Resonance Band Collective. All three of us also happen to be ethnomusicologists with experience in different cultural settings and backgrounds. Rob Baker is the coordinator of the Resonance London Band, as well as a fab musician and music teacher, author and ethnomusicology tutor. Jesse Tang is involved with Intercultural Churches UK, especially as the coordinator of the worship music ministry called Songs to Serve UK. She's also a piano teacher and host of the innovative podcast Across Culture. And I am Ian College, founder and leader of the Arts Release Ministry of WEC International, of which the Resonance Band Collective is a part. I also teach on ethnodoxology and multicultural worship in various institutions. So our context as the three of us is primarily the multicultural society of the United Kingdom, as well as drawing on our cross-cultural experiences, mainly in Africa and Asia. And today's seminar is about multicultural worship and intercultural worship, which we will hope to clarify as we go along. So to do this, we're going to look at some reasons some church stories, and a couple of song examples. So here we go. Over now to Rob Baker. Are you there, Rob? I'm right here. Hello. It's lovely to be here um, today, albeit virtually, um, with my esteemed colleagues, Ian and Jesse, um, who have worked with for many years and are absolutely delighted to be doing this with them too. Um, so I'm going to talk to you um, about why I believe and why we believe that the UK church and the church globally needs to adopt multicultural worship. Um, and so I'll uh, get the talk on for you. And here we are. Right. Hopefully that's visible to all of you. Um, so this is me talking about it. Right. So 10 reasons why. Now it says UK church, but this would apply to just about anywhere and certainly very much so in a Western context. Um, but uh, being from the UK, I'm talking primarily as a Brit, but it is definitely transferable throughout. OK, so we've got the paint palette here, which you can see, and there's no um, coincidence that these are all different coloured paints and that the background is a blend of different colours that all together make one picture. And that's how we see the world and its music and it's worship diet because we can use music from all over the world to worship and honour our Lord. OK, so uh, 10 reasons why the UK church needs to adopt um, multicultural worship. Number one, because music is not a universal language after all. Take a listen to this song by the Canela people of Brazil. <laughs> might think this is some kind of funeral dirge, some kind of sad, sorrowful song. But actually, if you thought that, you'd be quite wrong. That was a song of rejoicing for the Canela people, surprising as it may sound. The Canela people um, live in a very remote part of Brazil. Okay, their culture is unaffected, well, not entirely, but um, quite largely unaffected by the West and by Western musical tastes. So that was a song of rejoicing because the Canela reserve high-pitched wailing 
for sad songs. And so they sing low, like we just heard, when they're rejoicing. Um, there was even a story of a missionary in Brazil who was singing the old hymn, um, He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. It goes very high. He lives. And on that top note, a canela person came running in saying, what's wrong? Why are you sad? Why are you wailing? Why are you upset? Of course, the person wasn't upset. They were um, simply singing a joyful song from the West. But in canela culture, high pitched singing sounds like wailing and sounds like sadness. So my first reason is that music is not a multi, is not a universal language after all. Okay, although it's comforting, it, although it's comforting um, to see music as a one size fits all. And you've heard people say, oh, music, that universal language. It really is not. Um, it's a universal phenomenon, but not a musical, a universal language. So the way in which music communicates is not universal. A lively, happy song doesn't mean the same to everyone. If I sing bum ba bum 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 ba bum 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 ba bum 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 those from a Western culture will immediately go that's happy birthday to you. And it's probably already filled you with a slight bit of joy as you remember all those birthdays. But actually, for people of other cultures, untouched by those Western melodies, it will have almost no effect on them or much less effect on them because it is not a universal language. OK, so every culture of the world has what we call its own heart music. OK, and that differs from culture to culture. It even differs from generation to generation within those cultures to some extent. OK, so the Afro-Caribbean in your congregation, the Indian, the Nigerian, the South Korean, they will all understand music differently from one another. They will have different worship needs and musical needs. They will have different expectations of what worship means. Um, I had a colleague who was working in a um, culture that had um, Arabic links to it and they were talking about worshipping and singing and they said instead of because we go like this when we're worshipping when we're worshipping God we raise our arms maybe right up like this and he said oh put one arm out put the other hand in front like this like you're receiving but worshipping and in that culture this really meant something just holding their hands like that and um, this one woman in the congregation said for the first time I felt like I really because I put my hands like this. Something as simple as how you hold your hands, how you sing, how the song progresses is going to be different for every culture. Okay, so we need to take into account the cultural differences um, when we put our worship diet together. Now, number two, I'm sure this is the case in quite a few Western cultures. We become stuck in a bit of a mono genre worship rut. And those four chords will mean quite a bit to a lot of you. We've got G, E minor, C, D, or if you like, one, six, four, five. Um, sometimes it might go six, four, one, five, just for a change. But those four chords are used in the vast majority of worship songs of the last decade. And there's nothing wrong with those chords. There really isn't. But it's become so common and there's so much else out there. OK, quasi Celtic lilting pentatonic melodies in 6-8 time is another one you hear all the time. Ballad like almost like love songs over this identical chord pattern. They become our, our bland staple for too long. Yeah, there's so much more out there and we somehow settle for this generic lowest common denominator sameness. Um, I remember the reggae song, It Is The Cry Of My Heart. I don't know if you remember that. It is the cry of my heart to follow you all of the days of my life. Well, that is a reggae song. But if you think about it, it's just about the only reggae worship song that ever became mainstream. And even now, nobody sings it much anymore. Reason number three, it's enriching. Okay, using music from other countries adds another layer or in fact 
multiple layers. So if I said, oh, let's eat steak and chips every single night for a year, after a while you go, can we have something else? Steak and chips every night. It's all rather the same, same, same. Why don't we have some curry? Why don't we have some pizza? Why don't we have some chop suey? We could have all of those. We could have chicken tikka. We could have bolognese. We could have kebabs. Now, if our worship was like that, we wouldn't only be singing hymns and, you know, contemporary Christian songs that have crossed, you know, the whole world. We would be trying to embrace other cultures like we do with foods of other cultures. OK, but our worship has still got quite a long way to go, sadly, because we haven't embraced the musical styles and instruments and worship styles of those cultures to the extent which I believe we should. Reason number four. It's inclusive, of course it is. As we use songs from other cultures, we reach out to them and show genuine Christian love by including their musical expressions and traditions and not just our own. And when we represent these members of the congregation in this way, it builds bridges between cultures. But it builds bridges in both directions. Not only does it reach out to those of other cultural heritages. It also reaches to us because we suddenly find ourselves making a link with those other cultures and valuing those cultures in a way we might not have done previously. Okay. Um, the Resonance Band was leading in a, a Chinese church um, in Hammersmith a few years ago. There was a, we were singing a, a Chinese song called Wu Di Shen which means, oh my God, I worship you. And it's a beautiful song. And there was a guy in tears on the front row. He'd left China a good few months, if not years earlier. It was the first time he'd heard a song in Chinese. And he, there were tears rolling down his face because the Lord had touched him through that music from his own culture. Okay, reason five is biblical. Um, you know the, um, the commandment that says, Thou shalt sing the same songs as thy neighbours everywhere else in the West. I don't remember that one because it doesn't exist. And I believe that um, Christianity is about embracing all other cultures. I believe Christ came for every culture in the world. Um, and um, if we think about what the Bible says, then Revelation 7 gives us a good idea where Revelation 7, 9 and 10. Have a look it up if you've got it by all means. Revelation 7, 9 and 10 says this. After this I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count. From every nation, tribe, people and language. Standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. That gives us a good picture of what heaven will be like, of how inclusive it will be, how every tribe, tongue and nation is included. Um, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 9 says this. I have made myself a slave to everyone, to win as many as possible. To the Jews I became like a Jew, to win the Jews. To those under the law I became like one under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law. For I am not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law. He says, to the weak I became weak, to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by all means I might save some. I do this. Why does he do this? I do this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. And we too can do that, using musical styles. Um, melodies, instruments, worship songs from other cultures, we too are becoming all things to all people so that we may um, reach some with our gospel and the truth. Uh, it's educational because as we sing these songs, we're also learning to understand more about the instruments, about the costumes that are worn, about the underlying cultural values that go with that song, um, about the traditions. And all those things help us understand those cultures more. Ignorance breeds intolerance. But the more we learn about other cultures, the more we value and appreciate them.
And that awareness of those other cultures helps us to build friendships and to share our faith. Now, culture runs deep, deeper than you might think. You, you, it's very easy for us to say, oh, you've moved from wherever, you've moved from um, Ghana to the UK. Now you can sing like us. Now you can worship like us. But culture isn't something you lose quickly. When I was working in West Africa, I quickly realised that my British culture was not going to leave me. I wasn't suddenly going to become African in everything I did. I tried my best to bridge those gaps, but I was still British deep down and I still liked a cup of tea and I still liked, you know, fish and chips or a cream tea whenever I could uh, because that's part of my culture. OK, and um, there's a guy in my church whose grandparents were from the West Indies. He was born in the UK, yet the way he talks, the way he prays, the way he reads his Bible, the way he understands his faith and expresses his faith is still got traces and quite strong traces of that uh, West Indian culture because it's been passed down from his grandparents to his parents to him. And that is a big thing. Culture takes generations to change, to break down. We can't just get used to it and say, oh, sing our songs now you're here doesn't work that like that and it doesn't work that quickly number eight the need is urgent uh, there's a, a heartbreaking picture there of um, immigrants trying to make it across the English Channel to um, Britain or maybe across the Mediterranean to Europe okay um, there are there's a huge influx of um, people from other cultures and other countries arriving in the UK and in many other Western cultures and countries and in many cultures of the world full stop. Now, often these people might be uh, ripe for missions and for hearing the gospel because they're newly arrived. They need friendship. They need love. They need hospitality. We won't easily reach them by saying, here's a nice Western song that we sing in our church. Um, you'll get used to it. Because if the musical language is different, the message will not be communicated clearly. It's true across the globe. Wherever there are people from other cultural backgrounds, we need to use what makes sense in their culture to reach them and not expect them to make this huge leap of suddenly um, understanding our culture. OK, number nine, very quickly. Um, it's a tool for evangelism. I've touched on this already. Uh, Jesus used parables. He talked about farming, vineyards, sheep coins things which are part of everyday life and if we use global worship we're doing the same with reaching out with everyday elements of um, the lives of these cultures yeah so it's not just the language of the song's text that needs to be authentic but it's the musical language as we said at the very beginning music is not a universal language when we incorporate musical styles of other cultures um, it makes the gospel message clearer Finally, I've just about got into my 20 minutes. It's easier than you think. It's not about spending years becoming a master sitar player. If you do do that, brilliant, good on you. But it doesn't need to be that. You don't have to perfect your circular breathing on the didgeridoo. And just about all the songs that the Resonance Band do um, are learnable by the average church worship band. Um, and they include English translations as well. So the words need to be complex. We have a song called Jalali Yesu. Those are the only two words in another language. They're in um, Urdu and it means glorious Jesus. The rest of the, the, word, the, songs are, the song is all in English. But the style of music is still got that Pakistani feel to it, which will touch people. And those two words, Jalali Yesu, will also um, be enriching and blessing to people from that culture. It was written by a Westerner. And those are the only two foreign words in the song. So it's not as hard as you think. Um, and in closing, here's a video of the resonance band um, performing in a multicultural context. Okay. <laughs> Thank you.
There we are. How about that? Okay, now in closing, if we continue in our monocultural worship patterns, we're less likely to reach, bless, or include our brothers and sisters from around the world. But when we do branch out and create fresh, new, innovative forms of inclusive worship, the benefits are huge for all concerned. I'm part of a movement which I believe will gain momentum in the following decades to come. It's a movement which says everyone matters. It's a movement which says let's do something new and exciting. It's a movement which shows Christ-like consideration for all believers in our countries. It may not always be easy. And it certainly won't always be cosy and comfortable. But it will be dynamic, energising and an enormous blessing. Thank you very much indeed for listening. Back to you, Ian. Thank you, uh, Rob. That was uh, great uh, to hear you talking about us being part of a movement. Uh, and I do believe what we're talking about here in multicultural worship is actually to do with the nature of the future of the church. Uh, so what I want to share with you today is a story from a church that I was part of for a number of years uh, in, uh, in England, in the Manchester area, uh, a particular park called Oldham. So I'm going to share my screen with you, hopefully, and uh, we will see if I can get this going. There, hopefully that's come up for you. So this is a story of a church moving from monocultural white British to multicultural and eventually to uh, intercultural worship. Now this church uh, was in Oldham, it was planted in 1996 and that intercultural journey took place particularly from 2002 to about 2008 or nine or so. Uh, and I just want to see what was that journey like from the beginning? It's like, how do you start moving in this direction? But at the very beginning uh, of what I want to share with you, I want to quote from the Reverend Canon Yemi Adadeji, who was the founder of the One People Commission of the Evangelical Alliance UK. But now he's moved in to be the chairman of the One People Network across 20 countries in Europe. And he's a, uh, a speaker in demand across the world as well. This is what he says. Embracing diversity is like inviting people to the party. Isn't that great? Inclusion is inviting them to dance. That's better. But integration means we host the party together. I, I love that. So how do we get from invitation to co-hosting? And I would just like to talk about this as a process of learning and experimenting together. Learning and experimenting. So our church story in this particular regard started with the leaders of the church crying out, praying, change the color of our church to reflect better the community of our town called Oldham. And I remember one Sunday morning when we were praying that, there's three elders of us, and God stepped in, God answered. At the end of the morning service, I was at the, the door as people were going out, uh, and I saw an African man come towards me, coming up the steps and with his son. And he said, I'm looking for a church where I can play my drum. So I invited him to come back with his drum the very next Sunday, and he did. And that started things. The worship began to be a bit more multicultural, certainly in style and language diversity. But gradually we became more intercultural, where the relationships are more important. And equality began to be at the heart of it all. So Osman was his name. Osman came with his drum and his sound was played 
in every song that we sang, which was basically the regular style at that time of contemporary Christian music. But he added his sound into it. And then the leader of the church invited Osman to teach us a song from his country of Sierra Leone. And he taught us, he's a miracle working God. He's a miracle working God. He's the Alpha and Omega. He's a miracle working God. And I even remember it now. Uh, and that was quite some time ago, nearly 20 years ago. And uh, it took off in our fellowship. We were not a big church, but we took to this song. But notice one thing, it was a simple enough song for us to learn, and it was in our language of English. So then the leader said to Osman, why don't you teach us a song in your own language or one of your own languages? So he taught us a song called Telam Tenki, which is in the uh, Sierra Leonean Creole language. Uh, which means, tell him thank you, tell him thank you. Uh, what he has done for me, I will tell him thank you. Let him do for me, I go tell him thank you. So I'm going to play you uh, a little, quite, it's quite quiet this, so you need to listen uh, to this uh, little recording that Osman did for me just a, a few weeks ago into his phone. Telam tenki telam, tell Papa God tenki. What he do for me? I go tell him tenki. What he do for me? I go tell him tenki. Now I would say that we were in the early stages of understanding what it would be like to have songs from different cultures. And I don't think we did it very well. I don't think the song took off amongst us. Uh, and I think the reasons were we didn't give it time. We didn't work with the song with Osman. Uh, we could have involved children as well because that works well. Uh, and I understand in Sierra Leone, children also sing this song. So uh, we could have done that better. Uh, but Osman was great at bringing other people. He brought particularly African people. There were some people arriving in our town uh, as refugees and asylum seekers, uh, particularly from places like Rwanda at the time and uh, via Uganda. And so uh, one of those people was Sophie. And uh, she was the first of a number of Swahili speakers. And one day she gave me a CD of music from Uganda, clearly important music for her. So the third thing that we did was we tried to learn this song. I just jotted down the melody and chords like you see on the screen here uh, so that I could pick it up. I could learn it. I try to remember uh, the tune and so on. Uh, but what we figured out was uh, there's a leader and there's an echo. Now, that's something different for some of our English churches to have to learn. It's called call and response. And we fell down at this because actually in this song, uh, the echo wasn't quite exact. And the other thing that we had to learn was this song has dance moves. Uh, and we began to learn that although Sophie was not a, a, a song leader, she could teach us some dance moves to go with this song. I don't know if you can see what I'm doing, the, the arm movements here. Uh, in other words, in this kind of song, you don't stay still. It's got movement to it. Let me play you from that original CD that she passed to me.
Now, some of you probably know that song. And you probably know that there are multiple versions of that song in Africa, in different African languages. Uh, so that's quite a helpful thing to know because you can adapt songs like this to different languages. And in fact, there are different versions with bridge sections in it. Uh, and we now do one which has fewer verses, but has uh, a bridge section like that. Uh, and we do it in English and French, and we've got one or two other languages for it uh, as well. When we do it, it's the resonance band. And I think that's something that's really important for churches to understand, that you can adapt it. Now, this song, as uh, I heard it originally, had seven verses in Kiswahili and seven verses in Luganda. And if we had seven verses in English, that would be very long for our church in Oldham. So we had to kind of adapt it for our own setting. And that's the whole point about contextualization. You contextualize it for your own situation. Well, the next thing that we had to learn was actually we had some Iranians who arrived in our church. So we had to learn about Persian culture. And what we needed to learn from this uh, was we needed to translate a bit more. We needed to translate this beautiful poetic uh, language into English so that we could understand what we were all singing about. Uh, but we also had to understand that songs that they often like are in minor keys. Uh, we were calling minor keys, but in a Persian musical context, that's not how they would think about it. Uh, it's not that minor for them indicates sad. It's a different emotion that it's talking about, maybe an intensity or something like that. You can also have dance music in what we would call minor keys in a Western musical setting. So those were some things we needed to learn. I'm gonna play you a, a little bit of this song and the chorus that you can see on the screen comes a little bit after the beginning. beautiful words. I'm thirsting for your being, for your presence. I'm yearning. I'm asking, oh, my saviour, be my guide forevermore. What a beautiful song. But as part of what we were learning here was about the value of poetry, the poet, uh, poetic nature of the Persian language, in which even in ordinary conversation, they will use poetic uh, phrases. And another part was about the importance of the script. So uh, on one Sunday, we, we had an experiment just to project up words, these words uh, on the screen in church, uh, Persian poetry uh, about Jesus Christ, a loving savior. So it's not just about the songs, it's about other aspects of culture, uh, maybe visual art or movement or something that can be used uh, from the different cultures that we're learning from. Uh, and I think that can be so enriching as, as Rob shared earlier. So by 2007, this is five years later, the local paper, the newspaper called the Oldham Chronicle, ran an article on us. They did some interviews and they came to a Sunday service and they reported that we had 11 countries amongst us now. Uh, and they said that some of the people had come fleeing from their homelands because of oppression and others are here on work visas to build a new life. And Osman that I mentioned before was quoted quite extensively and he said that he had to flee from Sierra Leone because of the civil war and his, his wife Daniel's, his son's mother got kidnapped. She was abducted 
uh, by the rebels and he didn't know what had happened. So he said this, I've been a Christian for a long time, uh, although I'm from a Muslim background and I was looking for a church. I saw this big sign outside the Oldham Family Church in the old Hathershaw Community Centre and they welcomed me. It was not multi-ethnic when I came, but now it is diverse and I know diversity is part of God's will. And he goes on to say, it's like a recipe, great analogy. When you're cooking, you need different things in a recipe. That's what we need in, in worship, isn't it? Different things. And he says, this is what builds it. Love is what builds it. And he's talking now about intercultural worship, not just multicultural expressions, but intercultural relationships and community. Love is what builds it. And I know I was loved and welcomed. So what was going on? By 2008, the church leadership was still white British, uh, it's only a few years, uh, and we were looking for diversifying the leadership. Can't just happen overnight. Uh, but amongst the five white worship leaders of us, three would have a desire to lead multiculturally, to use songs from different parts from around the world, including from those people amongst us. We'd have discussions and training uh, uh, of the uh, music, particularly the worship leaders, but also the music team. We would meet uh, and have food together and learn some new songs. And occasionally, like on this occasion, we've got Shaker, also from Sierra, Sierra Leone. He was preaching on this occasion. Sometimes he would also lead us in worship. So what was going on? It was about intercultural conversations, about talking together a lot across our cultural differences. As leaders, we tried to adapt how we did things. We tried to learn from other cultures and eventually we could ask the more difficult questions like, what do you find difficult about British worship? Now, that's a very important question to ask, but we need to know that if we ask it, we have to be willing to adjust as well. So just in summary, really, uh, listening and understanding and sharing and experimenting and adjusting means that we can begin to grow together. And as we grow together, we can become something new together. So I just want to leave you with this thought about the difference between multicultural worship and intercultural worship. Because intercultural worship is not just about adding something to our existing worship. That would be multicultural, adding styles and languages and, and different expressions. But intercultural worship is about growing together to become something new. It's about growing together and to become a new community that expresses itself uh, naturally and equally in worship. So now if you're interested in this kind of thing uh, and you want some songs, maybe you want to take a picture uh, of these details, websites where you can get songs like this uh, and YouTube channels, the Arts Release YouTube channel, the Resonance Band UK and the Songs to Serve Europe uh, YouTube channel. Also go on to the playlist to the Arts Release webpage and uh, songs to serve have a fant fantastic data base of songs. So thank you very much for listening. I hope that's been encouraging to you. If, you. if you started the journey or if you're just thinking about starting it or if you miles ahead of us, I hope that's all encouraging to you. Thank you, um, Ian, that was really smashing. Um, loved that. Um, we're going to listen to a song now. I'm going to show you a clip of a song um, in Yoruba from Nigeria. Um, and it's um, called, firstly, it's I Just Want to Say Baba O Eshe. Now, Eshe O means thank you. Baba means father. So it just means thank you, father. And then it goes into a livelier one, which goes Baba Eshe O Baba Eshe O Baba Awadupe Baba, which is just saying thank you father and this is a song that they would sing in a church in nigeria but it's one that works really well in a um, uk context as well 
Um, there are lots of Nigerian Christians in the United Kingdom, um, in churches across the country. Um, and um, so this is a simple song that British people can latch onto, but that will also speak to the hearts and souls of Nigerian believers too. Here it is, Baba Esheo Baba. I just want to say Baba Esheo Super, good. I'm going to now hand over to my colleague Jesse Tang um, for biblical angles on multicultural worship. Over to you, Jesse. Esheo, Rob. It's great to be here with you all today. So let's go. Firstly, I'd like to say that God created all nations and he desires all nations to worship him together. So I'll start by reading Psalm 86 verse 9. All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. As God's people, we are called to worship him, and that is regardless of our culture, and yet we use our cultural practices in order to do so. So worship is both beyond culture and reflects culture. There are many expressions of arts around the world, so there are many worship expressions towards the same God. And I'm going to be focusing on sung or corporate worship today. So first I'd like you to think about your church. Is it a place where people can bring their whole selves or do they need to leave part of it at the door? And can they express themselves fully and authentically? And how can we cultivate such spaces where people can flourish? 
So worship is something that should be fundamentally disruptive because we take the focus from us to God. We lay down the kingdom of self for the kingdom of God. And worship then transforms us. It fuels us to love God and to love our neighbours. So here it says Romans 12. Well, we're reminded in Romans 12 to love others, to practice hospitality and to welcome our neighbours. Because as our neighbours change, so does our worship as well. And by using a different language and a different style, we're saying that they are valued. Their culture is God-given and the gospel is for them. So a couple of us were leading worship in Athens uh, about two years ago. And at this church, there were a few Chinese believers. And at the conference, we led this worship song, which Rob mentioned earlier, 我地神, 我要敬拜你, Oh my God, I want to worship you. And as we were singing, as we led this song, the Chinese believers in the church, they were crying. They were really touched by this. They understood that the gospel was for them and they could fully express themselves to God. They understood exactly what they were singing. And actually the amazing thing is also that the other people in the congregation were also really touched by their brothers and sisters and they were also crying too. And the whole congregation were able to worship the Lord together. These Chinese believers also invited their friends to our evening celebration, which you can see in the picture on the right. So we can use intercultural worship as a tool for evangelism. And you may know that some cultures are really good at spreading things by word of mouth. And for me, I also use it as a conversation starter. So perhaps I'll say, um, that we're singing Hindi at our church, would you like to come along? Or I might ask a neighbour, please can you help me pronounce some of these words which are in Polish? And we know that music and language connects to the heart and God wants to reach people in a way that makes sense to them. So let us be vehicles of that. We also read in Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost that a crowd of people from different nations heard the wonders of God declared in their own tongues, drawing them in. But cross-cultural worship does mean crossing into unfamiliar territory, which can be scary and also uncomfortable. But God exists outside of our comfort zones. In fact, we are to offer a sacrifice of praise. So in me sacrificing my worship preferences, it means my brother and sister can express themselves fully before God and come alive in worship, which in turn inspires me. And eventually I can also connect to God in their preferred style and language. So that means we can worship together and build unity. And I remember when I was leading worship in an intercultural church in Rotterdam, a city in the Netherlands, last autumn and there's a lady who's from East Africa and she always looked fairly serious and we sang a song called Sia Hamba in Isi Zulu which means we are walking as we sang the song we saw her doing this she was singing along she was marching her arms and she was beaming and at the end of the service she came up to me and she said thank you she said it reminded her of her childhood and she enjoyed it so much. So remembering these experiences also encourage us to keep going. Now sometimes I'm asked the question, should we even do intercultural worship if a church is largely monocultural? Well, yes, for all of the reasons that I said before, but also I want to give a few more reasons. One is that it gives exposure so we are reminded that worship is about more than ourselves. We learn about the global church and it helps us to think and to pray more missionally and also cross-culturally. For example, we can stand in solidarity with our brothers and sisters in Iran, for example, who are going through persecution. We might like to pray for them as we sing in Farsi. Or we could imagine what an underground church in China is like as we hear Chinese-style worship. So we join in 
with their grieving and we also join in with their rejoicing. Another reason is that it expands how the church worships. So here it says, when we see different expressions of God's people, we see different perspectives of God. For example, African worship is often exuberant with dance styles, themes of power, of freedom of community may come across. Chinese worship might emphasize suffering, uh, maybe poetry and nature, and South Asian worship might be more devotional or intimate in style. So we can experience God in fresh new ways, just like we can see God in the diversity of his people who are made in his image. So all of this contributes to showing a fuller picture of God. And last but not least, we can experience a foretaste of heaven. So Revelation 7 verse 9 was mentioned earlier, where we see every nation, tribe, people and language worshipping God together. I'd also like to share the strap line of my church, which says, celebrating Christian unity and cultural diversity on earth as it is in heaven. So we pray for that vision and we pray for God's kingdom to break into the present. And in this final slide, you can see all of the reasons why we should be pursuing intercultural worship in our churches. So I don't know if you'd like to um, take a snapshot of that. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to continue by talking about the Harrow story. This is the Harrow story. I'm going to be talking about my church, which is a new church plant in Harrow in North West London, which is called Mosaic. Now, it was planted as a missional community within a church called St. Paul's. It is a Church of England resource church. And we started meeting from the middle of 2019. Now, as mentioned before, and I'd like to share again, our strap line is celebrating Christian unity and cultural diversity on earth as it is in heaven. Notice here that we use the word um, intercultural church rather than multicultural because we believe in interaction and relationships. And this is London. London is one of the most ethnically diverse cities in the world and as highlighted here Harrow is actually one of the most ethnically diverse boroughs in London so in 2011 the census showed that 69.1 percent of Harrow's residents were ethnic minority when we're thinking about churches in general it would make sense for a church to welcome and honor the kinds of people who are in its locality, not just the part that is palatable, that makes sense to the majority culture, but somebody's whole self, including their cultural backgrounds. So this informs how we do church. And our vision of being an intercultural church is also driven by God's heart for all nations to know and to worship him. Planting an intercultural church is also a response to God's love because in God loving us, we also love our neighbours and as our neighbours change, that affects the way that we do church. So Revelation 7 verse 9, as mentioned earlier, that is what we are motivated by. And to be inter, intentionally intercultural um, is our strategy for how we do church. That's reflected in diverse leadership, in hospitality, such as table fellowship, we love eating together, and the way that we do outreach and street evangelism, and also how we do our services with representation from different languages and cultures. So in the monthly services that we've had since 2019, we've been using the St. Paul's Church building and the worship team mainly consisted of those from St. Paul's Church. The worship leader led songs that we learned from Arts Releases Resonance Bands and we adapted them for the church context. 
For example, we might sing a verse of a song such as Multilingual Grace by Proskineo in Ghanaian language of Chui. I'd like to share a story about this guy called Tas. Tas is a Tamil who has a Hindu background and he was invited to Mosaic's Christmas service in 2019 and afterwards he also visited a service at St Paul's where there was a white British worship leader who sang a Christian worship song in Hindi. So Tas was really amazed. He saw the humility and respect of this white British man choosing to sing a song in a language other than English and actually Hindi wasn't even Tas's own language. But such honouring of another culture really made a powerful impression on him. Since then, Tas became a Christian and he's now part of our Mosaic community. But due to family circumstances, our main worship leader had to step down at the start of lockdown in 2020 and from April our services moved online and I stepped up to lead um, and without a handover so I basically had almost a clean slate to start from. I led a mixture of Christian contemporary worship songs, English hymns and songs which originally are not from a Western background so I'll call that intercultural worship song for the purposes of this webinar and I averaged about two or three of these kind of songs per service. Now we couldn't mix households at first, so we were restricted to the intercultural worship songs that I knew how to sing, um, but we also used videos in our worship as well. And I learned a lot of different lessons, and I'd like to show you a typical outline um, that I tend to follow these days. I learned that it is quite good to start with an intercultural worship song to begin with. This doesn't disrupt the flow later on and people tend to be keen and ready to learn something new. And I also learned to try not to end with an intercultural worship song as people might be tired and they just like to sing a song that they are familiar with. So yes, yeah, so I'll just leave this on the screen if you'd like to have a look at how we do our church sometimes. ICW is intercultural worship, CCW contemporary Christian worship. From the start of 2021 we also ran an audit where we sent out a survey asking people in the congregation which languages they speak and any feedback that they might have about worship so far, any ideas that they might have as well. And uh, we also made a call out for who would like to join the worship team. There are a number of people who are interested, most of them are first generation immigrants and none of which who would call themselves musicians. So we had an initial meeting online to plan and to pray, but then we were able to meet in person for a socially distanced rehearsal. So here are some pictures from that. We first sang a well-known contemporary Christian worship song together. Also so we could gel together and also I could hear if they could really sing. Um, and we learned two songs, one Urdu song and one Hindi song. In our team we had a Hindi, a native Hindi speaker and she went through the song words with us. We were singing the song Yeshu Tera Nam, which means Jesus is the name. And the second gathering we had was at our church leader's back garden which was a much more relaxed atmosphere. We were chatting, we were eating uh, snacks, um, Chinese snacks and Sri Lankan snacks, and we were singing songs together. And before the rehearsal, I did ask some of the team for what songs they'd like to sing. We decided to sing in Hindi, Tamil and Sinhalese. And uh, while singing the Hindi song, one of the ladies said that the translation wasn't literal enough. So we did start to work on the translation together. In that sense, we were all co-creating. And from this uh, moment, I realized that this kind of worship wasn't a tick box exercise, but it came from an openness and invitation in wanting our church community to value one another's cultures, for there to be a representation and for us to bring and share, to bring something of our traditions our cultural practices and to share in it together 
thereby also creating something new. And instances like this also help to reduce cultural distance. That day in the garden, we sang There is Power in the Blood in Tamil, Sinhalese and English. And there has been a, ethnic, uh, a history of ethnic divide between those two groups in Sri Lanka. So I guess the question is, what does it communicate by us singing one song in those languages? It's a reminder that Christ's blood shed on the cross not only means reconciliation between us and God, but also between each other. And there's no division in God's love, so we must also learn to cross cultural boundaries. So we are yet to meet in person again, but I do have hopes for Mosaic and when we are able to gather, that the worship would reflect who we are, that as new people come and bring in their own cultures, that there would be continual sharing, mutual learning and understanding. I also hope that our worship would be a natural response that is born out of and built on the foundation of relationship. And I hope that we as a community would intentionally cross boundaries to make relationships and to learn what it looks like to embody an intercultural lifestyle, leading us to cultivate spaces where intercultural worship flourishes. Hello, thank you, Jesse. That was marvellous. Um, very much enjoyed that. Thank you. See, see. Um, we are now going to see a song called Yeshu Masi Ki Jai. Now that is in Hindi. Um, it's a song written by Evan Rogers, who's South African and is now a worship leader in the US. Um, however, um, it is a song that really speaks to the heart because those words Yeshu Masi Ki Jai means victory um, to Jesus the Messiah. The rest of the words are in English, um, but it's got the um, that vibe of a song you might hear in India. Um, it's a beautiful song. It's a fairly new one for resonance as well, uh, but it's already going down super well. So here it is. Um, enjoy this. This is contrasting to the um, uh, Esheo Baba song you saw earlier, because this was written by somebody from a different culture, but it's still in that style, and it's one that will speak to. Um, um, Western cultures as well as um, to Indian uh, believers and non-believers. So enjoy this Yeshu Masi Kije. Thank you, Rob. I'm going to just share some resources with you all now. So in front of you, you'll see some resources and some links. The first one is Songs to Serve. And especially if you go on to songstoserve.eu slash songs, you'll see the song database um, of different kinds of worship songs with chords, with lyrics, with on song, with a presentation and also a link to YouTube and sometimes audio as well. On the Songs to Serve page, there's also some more resources such as good books to do with intercultural or multicultural worship. Then below is Arts Release. And if you go on to that link, you'll see some different songs that you can download, chords and lyrics as well. And then also, if you search Arts Release or Resonance Band UK or Songs to Serve Europe, you can find their channels on YouTube. On the next page here, we've got uh, different places that you can 
do some training to find out more about multicultural worship. All Nations Christian College hosts different trainings for different levels, sometimes introduction, sometimes master's level as well. So you can keep an eye on that website there. So resonance bands can also lead workshops and can um, lead worship at conferences and events and churches across Europe and also in Singapore. And down here, Songs to Serve Europe and Intercultural Church Plants hosts a conference in Europe every year. And we also put on Songs to Serve training days to help intercultural churches um, to resource them and teach them more about cross-cultural worship. Yeah, so feel free to take pictures of this. Um, and now I'm going to hand back to Ian. Now I'm going to hand back to Rob. Okay, thank you, Jesse. That was super. Um, so now um, we are going to um, discuss in groups um, what is your experience of multicultural worship? Um, what are the obstacles um, that you can see and envisage? Um, for multicultural worship and intercultural worship um, and what questions would you ask uh, the panel so uh, what is your experience of multicultural worship if any um, what have you seen what have you seen work um, what obstacles are there in, in existence or which ones do you envisage and um, what questions have you got for Ian, Jesse and myself um, thank you Okay, thank you, Rob. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, I hope uh, everyone has had a, a good time so digesting some of the things that have been shared. For some, you'll be very familiar with this kind of topic, uh, but for others, it may be new or partially new. Uh, and uh, of course, this is going to be uh, something that we can discuss uh, in the global consultation on music and arts in missions and that's where there will be some opportunity for discussion groups uh, on this whole topic so you'd be very welcome to come along to those uh, in July uh, for the GCAM 2021. Okay thank you so I hope you've enjoyed it all uh, and we would love to be in touch with you so just write to us connect with us in whatever way you find you can do that. Okay thank you Thank you. Thanks. Bye.